He can keep his tongue. Disarm him! Minnie. <laughs> He's such a bitch. Okay, you know, fool me once, but I think I'm good saying House of the Dragon has achieved an amazing franchise recovery. Nonetheless, I mean, man, is this show hard to characterize. Sometimes the level of detail, the moral ambiguity, the connections to lore are overwhelmingly stunning and well done, and sometimes the characters just make no damn sense. We're in the same universe as Game of Thrones, but we're in a very different story world. So House of the Dragon covers the major civil war that destroyed House Targaryen, starting from the latter half of King Viserys Targaryen's rule. We follow the lead up to this war largely from the experiences of his daughter and heir Rhaenyra, who navigates political drama amongst herself her uncle Damon, the Hand of the King, Otto Hightower, and the daughter of the Hand, Alicent. The show has several time jumps that bring us a new generation of Targaryens from both Rhaenyra and Alicent, setting the table for what seems to be a poetically avoidable yet inevitable war. So, spoilers ahead for season one of House of the Dragon and all seasons of Game of Thrones. The war is set to be between the Blacks, led by Rhaenyra and Daemon, along with their in-laws and Rhaenyra's illegitimate children, against the Greens, led by Alicent and Otto, along with Alicent's children from Viserys. This is all roughly 200 years before the events of Game of Thrones. On my first watch, I hadn't read the source text, Fire and Blood, at all, but eventually I did read through the first season within the huge book, so I will say, as an immense compliment, I have halted reading because I don't want to spoil the show. I've never made that decision before. But genuinely, it is astounding how beautifully the characters and world come alive on screen the way they just don't in that writing. It's an astonishingly well-made show, from the music to the settings to the cast, all of whom seem really committed to this world and to each other. But that said, it's not perfect, and the storytelling is perhaps best described as bizarre. So here I'll take a look at the major differences in storytelling methods from Game of Thrones, which include dialogue and characterization, exposition, and consequences or story rules, and then four of the major characters. So first things first, and it's ultimately a good thing, we just gotta get over it, this is not Game of Thrones. I'd really rather look at House of the Dragon just entirely on its own, and I'm very grateful that they didn't use Game of Thrones as a crutch, as so many reboots and prequels and sequels do, by packing in stupid references or trying to copy the exact same formula. But it is impossible not to compare it to Game of Thrones at all. Some scenes are very close parallels. I am Lord Commander of the King's Guard. I recognize no authority but the King's. And until there is one, I have no place here. I am a knight. I shall die a knight. Even now I could cut through the five of you like carving a cake. Here, boy. Melt it down and add it to the others. When you look at it that way, Game of Thrones absolutely cleans up. It's just better at moments like these. Although, quick shout out to this Damon moment that's similar, but not exactly parallel. Add it to the chair. But as a whole, the two shows employ very different methods of storytelling. And that's fine, that's good actually, because trying to replicate Game of Thrones simply wouldn't have worked given the source material. House of the Dragon is based on really just a couple dozen pages of fire and blood, a huge history tome with a framed narrative of a maester assembling various accounts of the Targaryen dynasty. We don't see inside anyone's heads, we don't get much dialogue at all, and things move along very quickly since it's just a bare report of the events that changed grand history, not the intricate underlying buildup that led to them. So what are the main differences in storytelling approach? Well, obviously, House of the Dragon has a much narrower focus since we really only care about this one family, and it covers many years, so we have the disorienting yet necessary time jumps. But the reason for these, and the biggest game changer in total, is really that House of the Dragon is working towards a specific end. The end exists already. George R. R. Martin has already finished this book, and within the fictional universe, this story is pre-established canon history, so all of this stuff has really already happened. Whereas Game of Thrones started from the beginning and was ever expanding and stretching and building with no defined end in sight, House of the Dragon has the luxury of working backwards from a definite end. The show already knows what's important and what's not. And this comes with pros and cons. 
So let's look at some of the ways in which this key difference manifests. So dialogue and characterization. In Game of Thrones, most of the story was told through dialogue. Surface level meaning of conversations would move the plot along, and the subtext would build drama and nuance. That's part of how this show managed to have such an obscenely widespread appeal. People who normally weren't into fantasy would come for the political maneuvering and human drama. Brilliant dialogue also gave us beautiful pieces of wisdom and cleverness that could really stick with you beyond the context of the show. <laughs> You think my life is some precious thing to me. That I would trade my honor for a few more years of what of war. The plots might be about high fantasy issues that have nothing to do with our world, but the stories within these plots were usually human stories. On the personal level, asking questions about competing loyalties, the need to prove yourself, how we handle our vulnerabilities. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Wear it like armor, and it can never be used to hurt you. And on the abstract level, asking questions about the meaning of power, what justice is, if there's a distinction between doing the right thing and doing a good thing. What of your daughter's life, my lord? Is that a precious thing to you? It's hard to incorporate philosophy and human questions in a show without much dialogue. And this is definitely missing from House of the Dragon. Characters don't embody moral perspective or defined values. That doesn't mean they're bad characters per se, but they do function at a much less nuanced level. It's hard to break down what each side of this looming civil war represents. Neither side is completely lawful, neither side is completely wrong. The Greens are run by the High Towers of Old Town, which is the oldest city in Westeros dating back to the First Men before Aegon came, and it was formerly the headquarters of the Faith of the Seven. Though Old Town did not resist Aegon's conquest, you might think that the Greens embody the natural state of Westeros, resisting the outsider influence of Valyria, headquarters at Dragonstone, whereas the Blacks might embody the power of Valyrian blood with the Valarians and more Targaryens. But Aegon II was coronated with the Conqueror's crown, and Rhaenyra was coronated with her father's crown a crown that represents all the major houses of Westeros and a more diplomatic approach to ruling. She was also visited by the White Stag in Episode 3, and the White Stag is a symbol of royalty before dragons ruled over Westeros. So each side has connections to traditional Westerosi power. This is both a plus in that the use of ambiguity can highlight how tragic and unnecessary this war is, and perhaps put the audience in a position to just focus on the war and not pick sides or get upset. A lot of people seem happy about this, but personally I'd rather be able to love one side and love hating the other, but that said, since we know everyone is gonna die and it's gonna be horrific, it's probably better that we remain more impartial. Because Fire and Blood is written in historic retrospective, the people on the pages really seem like figures of history rather than characters. I know that sounds silly, but think about reading a real history textbook. You might see, you know, so-and-so was an angry, vengeful man, so he spent five years leading a war for revenge or whatever, and in the context of a history textbook, that's fine. But if you spend a moment thinking about it, you gotta wonder, well, surely there was more to him than that, right? What was this guy like? So the second we move from the bare skeleton of years of history into a fleshed out television drama, we have to fill in a great deal of depth to these people. But the depth won't come with too much nuance, since the nuance doesn't matter to history. And they did add a lot. Again, I hadn't read Fire and Blood before my first watch, but watching it again from the perspective of someone who has now read through season one in the book, I can confirm that watching from a book reader's perspective makes this show make a lot more sense. Most scenes feel like exciting bonus material. Some ambiguities from the book are fleshed out decisively. We get to see numerous interactions that don't land on the pages of the history book. It's a gift. But if you haven't read the book, it's a bit jarring to see what feels like a hyper-simplified romp through time. There's next to nothing written in the book about Lena Valarian, so from a book reader's angle, it's super exciting to see her at all. But from a non-reader's angle, it's really weird that she shows up and then dies so rapidly without us getting to know much about her at all, especially because she seems really cool. This is the two-sided coin of the writers knowing how this story will end. We don't waste any time. 
which Game of Thrones, if you look at it from the ending backwards, certainly did. Obviously, the ending made pretty much nothing matter at all, but even if it had ended well, things like how much time we spent with Oberyn Martell, as fun as that much time was, really could have been shortened to one or two episodes. House of the Dragon is efficient. It doesn't care if the audience wants to know more about Lena or Leonor or Rhea Royce. Characters just serve their fundamental purpose for history and then leave. To a retrospective history, Harwin Strong only matters in that Rhaenyra's first three children were illegitimate. It doesn't matter what his dynamic with Rhaenyra was, if he was clever or kind or funny, things that certainly would have been examined in Game of Thrones. That's just something we have to accept, particularly in this first season, which is really just the prequel to the prequel, setting up the chessboard for the real action. I think that's fine. And it's nice to know that we're guaranteed some satisfying payoff rather than spending years wondering how all the threads of the story will come together only to have Cersei and Daenerys just blow them all up. So with exposition, without robust amounts of dialogue, it's harder to build the world for the audience. Game of Thrones consistently used dialogue to teach the audience about the world we're occupying. Aegon and his sisters. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just Aegon riding his dragon. It was Rhaenys and Visenya too. Rhaenys rode Meraxxus. Visenya rode Vega. Fish. The sigil of House Tully. Isn't that your wife's house? Tully, my lord hand. Can you think of any reason the Lannisters might possibly have for being angry with your wife? Littlefinger is taunting Ned in a way that speaks to his character, but also takes our hand as the audience and makes sure we know what the hell is happening. Scenes like this are pretty rare in House of the Dragon. They're certainly counting on the audience to have seen Game of Thrones and thus to be familiar with the basics of this universe. That's fair enough. But the difference in experience of watching Game of Thrones between expert fans people who have read the books, listened to podcasts, really get into the lore of the world, and casual fans, people who tune in for an hour every week and then just live their lives, was not too dramatic. You could definitely be a casual fan and still have a profound experience with Game of Thrones. But my rewatch of House of the Dragon after knowing way more about the context was a way better experience than my first watch. Now, some of the references that are completely missable to the casual fan are fine if missed. When Rhaenys delivers the news of Viserys' death, both Rhaenyra and Daemon clutch a specific reference to Targaryen history. Rhaenyra places her hand on her unborn child, who in the books was to be named Visenya after one of Aegon the Conqueror's sisters. Daemon simultaneously grips his sword Dark Sister, which originally belonged to Visenya. That's a really cool detail, but it definitely isn't essential to notice. But absent much dialogue, House of the Dragon uses symbolic detail like that to actually build up the world. As such, it's really easy to miss out on key elements of this story universe. For example, they just barely show us what the dragon pit in King's Landing looks like from the outside. And if you miss that tiny detail, which I did on my first watch, then the buildup to Rainey's blasting through the coronation floor doesn't work. The shock just comes out of nowhere, so it doesn't feel cathartic or engaging. They don't spend any time at all explaining the regional geography of Westeros. They don't use the intro for that purpose. So if you don't know it already, then the importance of the Stepstones is totally lost. The proximity of Storm's End and Dragonstone is totally lost. And these are definitely key parts of the story. It's not until episode 10 that Corliss explains why the Stepstones are a good strategic hold. This really should have been explained in episode 1 when they first come up, so that we care about the wars there beyond our investment in Daemon, and as the war looms, we know that holding the Stepstones will be a huge gain for whichever side does. So we care more about what's happening to Corliss, and we get better payoff when he announces he holds the Stepstone. Likewise, if you don't know in advance that Harwin Strong will matter, he's entirely missable in episodes 3 and 5, where if you do know to care about him, you'll notice he and Rhaenyra building a mild relationship. It's a better show if he doesn't just come out of absolutely nowhere after the time jump. Same with the White Worm. The reveal that it's Mazaria means nothing if you miss the enormously subtle references to the White Worm in early episodes. I missed both these things on first watch, and I think others did too. 
There are tons of missable details even in the dialogue. In episode 2, Corliss and Lord Beesbury disagree over whether to attack the crab guy. Stepstone's geography aside, it's fully missable that Lord Beesbury's family is one that likely takes money from the Iron Bank, aka the Triarchy, aka the crab guy. That's not something anyone just knows, and this scene is pretty boring without that key explanation. Things like music, fashion, body language, and symbolism in general were all excellent, and by the end really the only saving grace, but at the show's height they were mainly decoration. In House of the Dragon, symbolism is a core communicator of the story. Again, if you're a casual viewer, you're apt to miss quite a bit. And while I like that there's a reason to rewatch and there's a reason to tune into weekly YouTube channels that break scenes down, I enjoy these things, I do think it's a shame that for most people who don't want to or can't invest that time, House of the Dragon is going to seem like a lesser story than it is. Using symbolic detail to tell the story is just a different approach to storytelling than using expository dialogue, but it's definitely less clear. It does, however, allow for some creativity that I loved. Kristen Cole fights with a flail, a weapon that can easily be perilous to its own wielder, hinting that perhaps this guy's own decisions will be his downfall. I classify that as just foreshadowing, but symbolic detail in House of the Dragon often does more than foreshadow, it can tell the story itself. When Damon gives Rhaenyra the necklace in episode 1, he waits for the ruby pendant representing House Targaryen to slide from the top of her dress to her neck before fastening it. This builds intimacy between the two of them in a way their dialogue at this point cannot. Likewise, the sex scenes in House of the Dragon actually serve a storytelling purpose, an unbelievably welcome improvement from Game of Thrones. They have a professional intimacy coordinator who thankfully protected the actors and was apparently much appreciated on set, which is great. And her work also uses these scenes to move the plot along. We can interpret them differently, but that Damon was, for whatever reason, unable to fully couple with Rhaenyra is a telling point for him and the story. I don't know, however, that the same can be said for the multiple traumatic birthing scenes. It seems like the writers want to evoke a thematic connection between childbirth and war, but they don't know what point they're trying to make, so they just make the scene really intense and leave it at that. They don't show us Alicent giving birth, but it's not a Valyrian focus only, since Emma was of House Aaron. It's a really heavy decision to include these in a show otherwise clear of gratuitous shock value, so I think for now we'll have to wait and see what the deal is. As for consequences and story rules, one of the most devastating disappointments of the later seasons of Game of Thrones was the market switch in method of storytelling from cause and effect to setup and payoff. Now, done well, cause and effect functions like setup and payoff, but it maneuvers with much more subtlety and feels a lot more real since that's how life actually works. There are countless examples. Season 1, Jorah Mormont reports to Lord Varys that Daenerys is with child. Varys tells King Robert, King Robert is angry and wants her dead, Ned realizes his old friend has turned into a monster, Ned therefore decides to warn Cersei before angering Robert with the truth of Joffrey's birth, and so on and so on until Ned is killed and wars begin. On and on and on, that was the glory of this show, it was absolutely masterful and it mattered to the audience to understand how this universe works. It was so well established that if a butterfly flaps its wings, a war could start, that we the audience, we built up a familiarity with the rules of this universe. So when Rob Stark decides to break his promise to the phrase and instead marry for love, we know something is going to come from this. We expect he'll be punished in some way. And again, his decision is a result of earlier ones. Lyanna Stark, back in the day, makes Ned swear to lie about Jon Snow's birth. Ned lies to Catelyn. Catelyn is a huge jerk to Jon Snow. Rob doesn't want to make the same mistake he thinks his father made, so he refuses to have a side piece. We don't know exactly what would happen when he makes this decision to marry for love, but when it does happen, we feel it right there with him. He made a decision, there was a consequence. That's the rule everywhere, no one gets away with bad decisions in this universe. It still managed to pull twists and surprises, though. You might think Ned wasn't killed as a consequence of his actions, but rather Catelyn's in arresting Tyrion and kicking off the tension. There's room for debate and interpretation, but the uniting law of the story is that actions will have consequences. That was a key element of the realism in Game of Thrones. That's definitely not the case in House of the Dragon. It's definitely not based on realism. There are some obvious standouts, Kristen Cole seems to have a blank check for public murder without repercussion. He brutally kills Leonor's lover Joffrey at a royal wedding party and no one bats an eye. 
Now, since there is a time jump, we can fill in some gaps ourselves. Maybe Kristen Cole did get in some trouble, but he was able to lie his way out of it, maybe. But what about Joffrey's family? Well, again, since House of the Dragon is working backwards from a pre-established end, the show doesn't bother with punishing Kristen Cole for this ostensibly stupid decision, since it knows it won't matter to the pages of history. At least in this moment, we all acknowledge that Kristen Cole screwed up, but characters also get away with acting stupid in ways that go unnoticed. It's remarkably dumb for Rhaenyra to leave King's Landing both times she does it and no one says anything. In both instances, her claim to the throne is being questioned. In the first one, her marriage to Leonor is being questioned, and the loyalty of the court is of paramount importance to maintaining one's claim to the throne, so leaving to hang out in Dragonland is a bad choice. But it's not acknowledged as one. The plot needed her to be away from King's Landing when Viserys dies, the whole thing won't work if she's there, so generally what we can come to expect is that plot needs as plot does. Back in episode 3, the Velaryons and Daemon are losing their war against the Triarchy. This makes no sense. They have two dragons, and their biggest problem is that their enemy retreats to caves, aka contained spaces with no escape and no oxygen access. Then they come up with this ridiculous plan to lure the entire crab army out of the caves by sending one man as bait. Again, that makes no sense. Their plan relies on the crab captain guy to make a very specific and very stupid decision, which he then does. No one would send their entire army out in the open in a war against dragons to kill one man who's been injured by multiple arrows. And look, I love this scene. I think it's awesome. I think it really works for this show. Matt Smith is incredible and he tells this beautiful character story without uttering a single word from the moment he lands his dragon at the strategy table to the last shot of the episode. It's beautiful. It's theater. But it most certainly is not realism and it most certainly is not logical cause and effect. I think it's totally fine that this show functions on different story rules than Game of Thrones. It's actually what I think most people who hadn't read the original books probably expected from Game of Thrones. And sometimes it manages to execute this illogical drama absolutely perfectly. But in other instances, big moments don't feel cathartic because we don't know the rules of this story world beyond plot does as plot needs. So it's much harder to feel like we're part of this world and can make viable predictions that either come to fruition in a satisfying way or are subverted in a twist. Things are more likely just to happen here. They just happen. Kristen Cole kills Lord Beesbury. That just happens. No buildup, no consequence. On the other hand, some decisions that do make sense seem really stupid because there hasn't been sufficient exposition. Sending Lucerys to Storm's End in the finale seems pretty stupid. He's very vulnerable, he's a valuable heir, they know the Greens were sending envoys as well, so sending this little kid out on a micro dragon seems really dumb. But it's not that dumb if we were to know for sure that in this world, messengers are never ever ever to be harmed. Now, they sort of quickly imply that right before he takes off, but it would have been far more effective if they had worked that rule of the world into earlier episodes such that it became embedded in the functioning of the story. That way we, like Rhaenyra, could watch Luke head out and assume that he's going to be fine. No amount of context, though, can justify the real stupid thing here, which is Rhaenyra writing a letter that literally just says, hey, your dad swore an oath. I mean, that is just abysmal diplomacy. I don't know what she was thinking. And there is a consequence in that the Baratheon guy obviously chooses to support the Greens. But I think someone should additionally say to Rhaenyra, what the hell were you thinking? And that's not going to happen here. When it comes to narrative cohesion and inevitability, it may be partially because the writers have to cover a huge period of time, but I do think there are some shortcuts being taken here that aren't so easily excused. As already discussed, sometimes events seem to come out of nowhere in this show, but that's one thing. It's another to haphazardly retcon underlying themes as if they were there from the beginning. And this is my biggest gripe with House of the Dragon overall. I've done my bit as a viewer to readjust my lens on this show from Game of Thrones style to epic history, and that works for me. I think we've all agreed that the intro, which thankfully uses the same music, pales in comparison to that of Game of Thrones. And one issue is that it does very little to help us understand the world, whereas the map was genuinely handy. 
but here's my little pitch to defend it. So for those who rightfully skip over it, we start with a depiction of dragons fighting each other. This is Aegon the Conqueror's big quest that kicks everything off for the Targaryens. It's the first domino to fall that then leads to all the various bloodlines and marriages and deaths, each of which in this sequence are represented by mini sigils for each character. This, I admit, is stupid and confusing. We already have to memorize house sigils, and it's completely unreasonable to expect us to understand who's who here. The show is doing this a lot, using little pieces to represent people. We see it when Rhaenyra is selecting the next Kingsguard, when the Velaryons and Daemon are planning battle, when Team Black strategizes at Dragonstone, and of course in the small council with those little marbles. It reflects the focus of the show. Inner development and abstract philosophy don't matter so much here. People are just literal cogs in the tides of history. Clever shots like Rhaenyra pouring wine in her father's cup, shot from the same angle from which we see blood fill up in the Targaryen sigil in the intro, and of course Viserys' face rotting on one side communicate the inevitable decay and bloodshed to come. So the intro is a reminder that all of these fates are already set in literal stone. Music also reinforces this idea. The song playing here, as Rhaenyra sneaks through Maegar the Cruel's tunnels to meet Daemon, is called The Power of Prophecy, and it recurs in moments that at surface level don't seem pivotal, but clearly from the perspective of grand history are. Here, she's literally going deeper and deeper into the cavernous halls of Targaryen history, sort of the symmetrical underside to how dragon riders take to the sky, suggesting a spiritual balance to this family. This story couldn't have started after the time jump and used flashbacks because everything needs to flow with just as much inevitable rhythm as gravity. Fate is pulling these people towards their demise and the demise of something greater than the sum of its parts. I like this idea a lot. It helps distinguish this show from Game of Thrones and build up the lore of House Targaryen in a way that also contributes to Daenerys' eventual doomed narrative. So what's the force pulling all these characters towards fate? Well, clearly they want a lot of emphasis on Aegon's prophecy, which we first hear in those tunnels. A Song of Ice and Fire is the name of the prophecy. It's a little weird to hear because we all now know that Arya kills the Night King, which makes no sense, but I've heard talk of a Jon Snow spin-off series, so I wonder if they're doing something to repair the idea of the prince that was promised to justify another series. I don't know. Either way, Prophecy is supposed to be a big deal here. Now, they don't make this super clear, but in the Targaryen family, there are dragon riders and there are dreamers. In the show world, I suppose Aegon the Conqueror was both. The dreamers are accurate. The Targaryens actually only escape Valyria thanks to a clairvoyant dream, and Viserys, who has retired from dragon riding, seems to really want to be a dreamer. I don't know if he is. It's worth noting, though, that the show really emphasizes fate as a key theme through this prophecy. But I have a hard time fully buying into the inevitability of the show's trajectory because of the inconsistency of cause and effect storytelling and bizarrely blunt character development at points. The seemingly pivotal moment of Kristen Cole and Rhaenyra getting together was a really interesting scene with regards to consent. He clearly has some feelings for her, but that doesn't mean he's willing to act on them. But then the way things escalate is remarkably sudden and very heavy-handed. He goes from being a layered, conflicted character, largely sympathetic with hints of strife, to acting like a Disney villain. It should feel like from the moment Daemon encouraged Rhaenyra to do whatever she wants, to Rhaenyra going after Kristen, the fate of Kristen's character was sealed. But instead, there's this huge 180 switch from this guy's biggest conflict being his devotion to duty, to him cursing out Rhaenyra in public and bullying her kids. This flip was entirely unpredictable. We might have sensed some internal conflict between duty and lust or love, but it was absolutely impossible even to imagine that he would turn full evil crazy incel boy and betray her so viciously. To make this character interesting, he needs to have a reliable pattern. The showrunners refer to Daemon as the show's agent of chaos, but it's not. It's this guy. He follows no rules, legal or internal. Likewise, with Aemon demanding an eye from Luke in the finale, right after Aemon loses his eye as a child, he says, you know, no worries, it was an even trade, I got a dragon. Then, when we first meet him as a young adult, it's clear that he's much more kingly than his disgusting brother. He does taunt his nephews, but he holds himself superior to everyone in the room at all times except for Daemon. 
So when at storm's end, he decides to be petty and demand an eye just as his crazy mom did once, it feels very disruptive to this character's development from bullied loser to like pirate badass. This isn't badass at all, it's really embarrassing, and I don't mean losing control of the dragon, I mean being childish and weird. If we want Luke's death to be inevitable, which it should be given the theme of this show, Eamon should really need this stupid justice from Luke. Losing his eye has just made him look super cool. We've got no reason to believe he's been adversely affected. Obviously, you don't want to lose an eye, but he's the best fighter of their generation. He's got the biggest dragon in the whole world. And he's much sharper and more intelligent than his peers. None of this adds up to petty bullying on a diplomatic mission. And as such, the beautiful concept of fate and things being set in stone is undermined. I think it's totally fine that the actual death was an accident since it reinforces the idea that dragons really can't be controlled, but he needs to have at least had a cause for his decision to seek justice in this way. Those are character issues, but they do this with plot points too. The White Worm is apparently driven by wanting to close down the child fighting pits, and Otto is like, uh, yeah, I'll get right on that. But we've literally just found out about them, so this seems entirely irrelevant to the core story. Like the Stepstones, the show confers narrative meaning after the fact. So again, the conflict between the White Worm and the royal family doesn't seem inevitable at all. Additionally, the existence of the White Worm was totally missable if you don't know to look out for that name in earlier episodes. So before we look closely at a few characters, I want to highlight something that's perhaps another byproduct of moving through time too efficiently. The show frequently tells us things about characters that is rather removed from what we actually see. We hear over and over again that Leonor is a good man, and he's certainly preferable to her other suitors, I like him, but what we see is that he really screws up their arrangement in later years. Likewise, Otto Hightower is clearly supposed to be a conniving puppet master, but from my viewpoint, he's chief idiot. When Viserys dies, it's revealed that the small council has been plotting to usurp Rhaenyra's claim for quite some time. Now, we already know that the writer's strong point is not council meetings. Showrunner Ryan Condal said that the small council scenes in Game of Thrones were always some of his favorites, so he wanted to include a lot of them in House of the Dragon, but then he, quote, discovered that writing scenes of a bunch of people sitting around a table and talking are more difficult than you'd think. Sure. So the big secret plan, which I hoped to involve at least some clever maneuver, some blackmail, some trickery, a heist, was really just round everyone up and kill people who protest. So, no matter how much this guy is presented as intelligent, I will never see that. There are similar problems with the four characters we're about to look at, Alicent, Rhaenyra, Daemon, and Viserys. Congratulations, stepdaughter. What a blessing this is for you. Love the detail of Damon not standing up for her there. Okay, Alicent Hightower. I've seen Alicent develop a fan following online, but I'm sorry, Alicent is the worst. No, that's not an opinion, it's a fact. And she's not the worst in a fun way, and this is another crucial distinction from Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, the Lannisters are blatant villains, but they're absolutely magnetic on screen. I'm genuinely bummed when Tywin dies, even though I wanted him to die, because his presence was so compelling. Alicent was almost compelling. In the first five episodes, Alicent is set up to be almost like a traditional heroine in gothic literature. She's locked in this gilded cage amongst men who won't listen to her, and she has to watch her old friend romp around with no repercussions. She has a thematic dedication to duty and law. She is ever polite and subdued, but she's screaming in silent pain, and it all leads up to her showing up in that green dress, a turning point for the character. As I've said, characters don't seem to embody ideas larger than their own personal motivations, but Alicent almost did in the beginning. They started to set up this idea that Alicent and Rhaenyra have opposing methods of coping with the patriarchy. Women using methods other than armies and fighting to flex their power is a common theme. In Hamlet, for example, Ophelia doesn't outrightly say that she knows what's going on, but shortly before her death, she hands out flowers that each have symbolic meaning. Likewise, the green dress hinted at a creative character, someone who, in the years to come, will be powerful in their own way. But then we have the time jump. I don't know if it's partially because I think Olivia Cook really looks like someone who knows what an iPhone is, but even though she's a great actress, I can't stand this character from the time jump onwards, and again, not in a fun way. Rhaenyra is just delivering her third child. Following the pre-time jump setup, I would imagine that Alicent is the only one who sees Rhaenyra for who she is, that everyone is content and unsuspecting except for Alicent. 
Here's another Telverse show. The actors themselves say that Allison is being gaslit at this moment, and the character Allison complains to Larry Strong that no one in King's Landing sees the truth. Were that the case, Alicent would have to be intelligently subtle with her delicate political maneuvers, but the very first thing she does is make Rhaenyra present her literal newborn baby the very second he's born. So we can't believe that she's been silenced over and over until she snaps when Aemon loses an eye. If you're at the point where your old best friend who hasn't actually done anything to harm you is bleeding on your floor as you demand to hold her baby, you've already snapped. And that's just her first scene. From here on out, she's completely brazen, openly challenging Rhaenyra's family and legitimacy in just about every single scene she's in. It's way too heavy handed. We get it. We know what she's thinking. Obviously, she's got the big scene where she literally stabs Rhaenyra. And while that was unhinged, it was actually pretty on brand with what we've already seen of her. And this is her second big moment. Her first was that subtle but powerful green dress entrance. And it was perfect. This is both too much and not enough. She also, she keeps on complaining that no one in King's Landing is on her side. She's all alone. And look, no, you're not. Literally everyone agrees with you except for Viserys. Everyone is on your side. In fact, it's really overbearingly pro-green in King's Landing. So everything that was set up by her last pre-time jump appearance is lost. No subtle maneuvering, no clandestine communications to those few loyal to her, no long con planning. And think about it. What motivates this character? What does she want? Well, the common refrain is what Otto warns. If Rhaenyra does ascend, then Alicent's children are in danger. Fine in theory, but in that very episode, Rhaenyra offers to betroth Jace to Alicent's daughter Helena, saying the two should rule together. And Alicent denies her, choosing to betroth two of her own children together instead. I can have no sympathy for her after she does that. And I have no idea what she wants. They clearly want to give her moral cover by having the ridiculous bedside misunderstanding as Viserys dies, but honestly that just makes her seem like an idiot. And maybe she is? It's hard to get a read on Allison's intelligence. It seems like the show wants us to think she's crafty and organized, but she's utterly chaotic and often mistaken. It's not until episode nine that she realizes her father has been using her, which is ridiculous, it's so obvious. She authorizes arsonry by accident sometimes and then on purpose to kill the white worm. An intelligent high roller in court would use the knowledge that they're being spied on to their advantage. I also wish we could understand Alicent's relationship to her son Aegon more. As much as Cersei annoyed me, it was at least interesting to hear her explain why she loved Joffrey even though he shocked her. Also, while I do prefer this character pre-time jump, it's worth noting that the first rift between her and Rhaenyra comes when she lies to Rhaenyra about Viserys, not just through omission, but also in manipulating Rhaenyra at Viserys' request. She lies as they pray to both of their dead mothers, and then acts shocked and disgusted that Rhaenyra would lie about getting with Daemon, presumably because Alicent's devotion to duty and honor is so robust that she's enraged that Rhaenyra would scorn duty as heir? I don't know, but if you're gonna sell me on this character as honorable and just, you cannot have her put Aegon II on the throne. He is a monster in every sense. And out of everyone on the show that he's met, he's easily the worst suited for the throne. Allison is all over the place. She's neither a love to hate him villain with real agency, nor a sympathetic heroine who's a victim. She's sacrificed to absolute ambiguity because the show doesn't want us to pick sides. But it's her friendship with Rhaenyra that's supposed to be the grand arc behind this civil war. So let's look at Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra is clearly built to be sympathetic to a modern audience. Obviously, the idea that she'd be passed on as heir because of her gender and later forced to marry someone she doesn't know is unsavory to us. This was actually another initial turnoff for me, as in episode one, she tells her mother she'd rather be a knight. I felt like we were buckling up for an early 2000s Disney trope, but by the time she's an adult, this dilemma seems to have entirely dissipated. They use a very traumatic birth scene to juxtapose giving birth to planning battle, but I'm not sure what their point is. The only scenes we get of her with her children are all lovely. She clearly likes being a mother. But she's also still combative, she's still a dragon rider, almost like you can be both. But beyond that hint of an inner conflict, that never amounts to anything. She's a relatively flat character whom I truly struggle to understand. Her biggest function is to be the lawful yet unlawful heir, but I have no impression that she's actually interested in ruling. 
As a child, they show her repeatedly ditching her responsibilities to ride her dragon or go out into the streets, so she often shows a similarity to Damon in her bold decision making and rush to action. They build up the connection between these two thematically. In episode 3, the two characters actually don't interact at all, but they each emerge covered in blood at the end, again connecting them without dialogue. They seem to be fated to be together. Says Rhaenyra herself, quote, You and I are made of fire. We were always meant to burn together. Damon likewise says to Viserys that if he were to wed Rhaenyra, they would return House Targaryen to its rightful glory, which is a huge dig at Viserys, but also builds the idea that the two of them represent the fire and blood of their family. But fast forward, and suddenly Rhaenyra's thematic connection is to Viserys, not Damon. We've never seen her mention or care about the prophecy until the finale, where suddenly she has this ethos as a ruler to protect innocent lives, which is in conflict with her prophetic need to be queen. This is a cool idea, but it's pretty antithetical to the Rhaenyra we've seen up to that point. She's never cared about duty, she's never cared about what anyone thinks, in fact, she's openly said so multiple times. But suddenly, she and Daemon aren't burning together, they're diametrically opposed. I see people all excited for her post-Luke death mad queen action, but I really hope they don't go in that direction, mainly because it's boring. I get that they don't want us to pick sides, but you know how boring it is to watch a football match with utter indifference? It's so boring that our brains tend to pick a side to generally support, even if it's for a random reason. The showrunners surely know this, so instead of making sure that neither Rhaenyra nor Alicent show bloodlust until they have to, they should guide us into emotional connections to both sides, meaning both sides have to show character and cause to want the throne. That way, we as the audience are engaged, conflicted perhaps, but not bored. At this point, what's inspiring about Rhaenyra? Why would anyone fight for her? She's obviously preferable to Aegon II, but that can't be it. As to her bond with Alicent, it's completely all over the place. We should see these two as utterly inseparable and perhaps codependent in early years. Their friendship isn't built as essential to either one of them, so when it dissolves, I really don't care. Alicent is a complete monster to Rhaenyra after the big time jump, and then a couple of years later they bond again, and Alicent has kept that page Rhaenyra ripped out? Their affection for each other, which I can't call love because I don't see it, is entirely sporadic and not built into a cohesive narrative from start to climax at all. Where Alicent lacks conviction, Rhaenyra is decisive and intentional in her actions, so for me, it's way easier to see this story from Rhaenyra's point of view. I just wish that they would ground her somewhere thematically, rather than shifting her ethos around without narrative cause. I see Rhaenyra, Daemon, and Viserys as the potential embodiment of the Targaryen sigil Three-Headed Dragon, the reincarnation of Aegon and his sisters. And as the de facto protagonist and occasional middle ground between the two others, Rhaenyra should really be the most inspiring of the three. I also thought, given her initial entrance on Dragonback, that her dragon would be a character in and of itself, but so far it's the most boring dragon. A sad metaphor. So let's turn now to the most interesting one by far. I will speak of my brother as I wish. You will not. All right, I hate to say this about a show that ostensibly features two women leads, but Damon really carries House of the Dragon sometimes. I think the casting team deserves more credit than the writing one for this. Matt Smith maneuvers silent scenes to express layers of nuance that are just miles ahead of the source material. He's one of the few characters also to be introduced with a contradiction. Now, contradiction is a common way to introduce a character because it implies a story. So we see him sitting arrogantly on the Iron Throne. The guards say they haven't told King Viserys that Daemon's there yet, implying that Daemon is a problem person. And then he walks towards Rhaenyra and they have this very tender, genuine moment. So the contradiction between outer persona of arrogance and quieter sensitivity immediately pulls us in. He then publicly acts like someone who wants the throne, but in his private moments, he doesn't seem to at all. I love this about him, the character poses a question, what does he want? And it's built, unlike Alicent, he's built through complexity, not confusion. Something in him holds him back from being the reckless villain that characters assume he's gonna be, and it's up to us watching to figure out what that something is. In the text, it's said that the Targaryen family has produced both great men and monsters, Prince Daemon was both. He was made of light and darkness in equal parts to some, he was a hero, to other, the blackest of villains. 
What an awesome build for a character, and for 9 episodes, this works great. He can be an agent of chaos, but there are also clear patterns to his behavior that flesh him out beautifully. For 9 episodes, if you are someone who has earned his respect, he won't harm you, he will defend you in his way. Look, if he really wanted the throne from the get-go, he would just kill his brother, that's easy. But it's clear that what he wants is his brother's trust. He doesn't deserve it, and he self-sabotages, but being disinherited doesn't injure Daemon because it means he won't be king. It injures him because it means he isn't trusted by his brother. And so he acts out in ways that confirms that distrust. His lowest moments are when his brother offers him pity. He can't stand needing help. That relationship is certainly murky. An even clearer pattern is that if you're Rhaenyra, he'll never harm you. In episode 2, her showing up at Dragonstone and speaking High Valyrian had him at a loss for words, throwing the egg back and giving up the fuss. In episode 4, he's clearly planning on sleeping with Rhaenyra publicly, but when she turns to face him, he's again at a loss. Over and over, Rhaenyra is the one force that cuts through Daemon's bullshit ego trips. So, when he chokes Rhaenyra in episode 10, the semblance of a nuanced yet cohesive character is pretty much shattered. People online are all like, of course he'd do this, of he's always been violent, he's always been a bad person, the writers say this too, and yeah, he has, he's not a good person. I'm not upset at how he acts bad, I'm upset about when he acts bad. I've also seen that they cut a handful of scenes that made Damon more sympathetic, such as consoling his daughters after their mother dies and mourning the loss of Rhaenyra's child Visenya. Meanwhile, they added that he killed his first wife. This isn't an ambiguity in the books, he's somewhere else at the time. That's fine, I don't care if they change from the source text, but he's not the Joker, and if you strip him of his moral compass, and to be clear, I don't mean a good one, just his, then he too becomes unpredictable and unengaging. The writers say in that moment he's insulted that Viserys didn't share the prophecy with him, but he shouldn't be surprised by that, and as the audience we certainly aren't, so the moment is confusing and jarring. But besides that one moment, I absolutely adore Daemon as a character. Although as I said I enjoyed Tywin Lannister's screen presence, I'm not normally one of those people who enjoys the villains, but Matt Smith's dramatic maturity builds so much onto this already interesting character that when he's on screen, I really can't look away. He's also the only character with a sense of humor. Laughter is entirely missing from this show, so his energy is really needed and makes him stand out even more. But to me, the coolest thing about Damon is his immense respect for his own family. When he's on, like, sabbatical just before Lena dies, he's poring over the history of the Targaryens. He can't not. He can't stay away. He alone knows the tunnels that Maegor the Cruel made in the Red Keep. I wish they had made that clear for non-book readers. Matt Smith has said that when Damon speaks High Valyrian, it's the most relaxed and comfortable version of the character. Clearly, the ancient pride of Valyria is in this character's blood. His gift of a Valyrian steel necklace to Rhaenyra, their wedding being a traditional Valyrian one, his anger that Otto was chosen to be hand over him, all create the closest thing we have to a personification of an idea. He's the only character whose dragon is directly complementary. Caraxes, known as the Bloodworm, is menacing and protective. They show the imprecision of the way Caraxes fights, injuring their own people and stumbling here and there. It's very clever. If Daemon is the dragon rider, to Viserys' dreamer, great. I love that idea, and I'm sure he's about to unleash all sorts of heinous acts next season. But for all the work Matt Smith does to have us looking at Daemon and wondering, man, what is he thinking? What are his true feelings? The answer can't be chaos, nothing, violence, madness. It should be family. Rhaenyra and their united pride. I will sit the throne today. <sighs> the consumption of Viserys as a character is the most puzzling aspect of this show's fanfare to me. He's being compared to Ned Stark. Ned Stark as the season one hero, the tragic family man who just wanted peace and love, and I can't stand that. So here's what I think happened. They gave Viserys an absolutely beautiful one-act play in episode 8. Everything about this performance in this episode is stunning. Visually, of course, a screenshot image of him from this episode tells a story on its own. But Patty Constantine also works wonders as this decaying remnant shadow of a king dragging himself with pride and duty to protect his daughter as his final act before death. He asks his family to see him as a man, a father, a grandsire, not just a king. And that very request evokes a tragedy of someone who never got to be who they are because of what they are. This is a deeply impactful goodbye to a king, and it felt like Shakespeare, tragic and political and inescapable. But look, that's just episode 8. 
And it only works if you let yourself forget who he's been up until that point, which apparently a lot of people have. I will never, ever, ever overlook the monstrous thing he did in episode one, which to the extent that evil is commensurable is in my opinion, far worse than anything Damon does. And I don't care so much that a lot of the audience still adores Viserys, I care that the show angles us to. I care that what he did is buried in a character rehaul that allows this man to be remembered as a kind person and a good king. And that's how they talk about him, as if he embodied kindness. So let's remember that in episode one, he kills his wife Emma in one of the most horrific scenes that this entire franchise has produced. He's given the choice to cut her open in an attempt to save the baby that would categorically kill the mother. And out of desire to have a son, he makes the decision to go for it without consulting her, or, and this is just brutal to watch, without telling her what's happening. I was confident that they would make this decision hang over the child's head for his entire life. That finding out what happened would destroy the relationship with his father, but that obviously doesn't happen since the child dies immediately thereafter as well. So then I thought, okay, what a bad start for this show, but I assume Viserys will be tormented by regret and shame until his very last breath, but no. No, he clearly misses Emma and loved her more than Alicent, but at no point does he show regret for his decision. They almost make a point of comparing this to Lena's death, where Damon is presented with the same choice and doesn't make one, Lena overhearing and deciding to end her own life, but once again, they just hint at evoking this heavy theme without seeming to have anything to actually say about it. Anyway, I think Emma's death, as she cries in confusion and fright, is the most horrific moment of this season, and it's why I watched the first episode and then put this show away for a while before trying again. And all of that aside, I still don't buy Viserys as a good king. This is supposed to be the apex of the Targaryen dynasty, but King's Landing feels very similar to how it does under Robert Baratheon's lazy reign. Viserys is spoken of as a masterful keeper of the peace, but there's a scene during his son's second birthday party where a messenger comes saying the king has urgent business to attend to regarding the war and the stepstones, and Viserys just tells him to go away. It's not that he has a profound interest in peace, it's that he has no interest in action. He doesn't name Rhaenyra heir until he thinks he absolutely has to. And then when he maintains her position after the birth of his son, I don't really understand why. If he's motivated by keeping the realm together, then he should denounce her since it's been established that naming Rhaenyra really upset a lot of people for some reason. So. I imagine he's motivated most singularly by the prophecy which he's interpreted to require Rhaenyra, but why? And why only now? He's all over the place, he changes dramatically from episode 1 to his last appearance, but not by following a natural arc at all. All in all, I think he's one of the weaker characters, but he holds a great deal of importance in this first season, and I do like the idea that his last few years of life were the only thing holding this shit show family together but I wish they had made it more clear why. He's got some great symbolism from half of his face rotting off, the half, by the way, that faces the high towers at the Last Supper, and the Iron Throne literally ripping his body apart is just some beautiful visual poetry. I love also that he would rather be playing with his Lego set than ruling a kingdom, but that again speaks to how he was not a good king. And I just wish that his actions matched his, for whatever reason, good reputation. Okay, obviously there are plenty of characters whom I did not discuss. Rhaenys and Corlys are two of my favorites, and Corlys actually has a motive that does represent an idea. He doesn't care so much that Rhaenyra's children are bastards because, he says, history doesn't remember blood, it remembers names. Good point, well made. There's plenty to say about these two, about their children. Vaymond, Larys Strong, the White Worm, and so on, but generally the characterization issues fall under the same categories as presented by those major characters. Inconsistency and the gap between what we're told to think about someone and what we're made to feel about them. I wish Damon had just beheaded Otto Hightower on that Dragonstone Bridge in episode 10, or honestly episode 2. Just a note to say again, think about how we saw Tywin Lannister command respect in every scene he's in. We know what motivates him, he tells us and he shows us. And we see it manifest as inner conflict in a despicable way when it comes to how he handles his three children. 
putting him in one-on-one -on -one scenes with Arya Stark also revealed another side of him that complemented, not confused, but complemented what we've already seen. He was terrifying, commanding, and evil, but in a way that made sense to him as a person and for him as a character. Otto, uh, well, I hope he dies soon, but the actor seems nice. The next generation is obviously going to be a bigger deal in the years to come, except for Luke, RIP, and I'm excited to see how they step into those larger roles. One big way in which Game of Thrones has House of the Dragon beat is in characters being cool. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's one of the reasons people kept coming back to the show. Supporting characters like the Hound, the Blackfish, Tormund, Brienne, Ilaria, Olena, they were all charismatic and gripping, even if some were narratively disposable. So I hope that the future leads like Jace, Bela, Reyna, and Aemond get to step into their own charisma more. This war is called the Dance of the Dragons because obviously the dragons are gonna destroy everything. So I also hope we get more dragon content, not just boom, boom explosion, but knowledge about them. Dragon lore, give it to us. Overall, this season isn't perfect, but it could have been. It has all the ingredients of a perfect debut season of television, but it seems to have a disorganization problem, landing some characters with sporadic dramatic development, and despite being much more tightly wound and focused than Game of Thrones, lacking an undercurrent narrative that brings the story from episode one to episode 10 in a cathartic and cohesive way. Sometimes the writing is really thoughtful, when Aegon assaults Diana, while it's ambiguous as to whether Alicent gave her plan T, as they're calling it, or poison, we at least felt her suffering through her words. Game of Thrones had this disgusting issue where torture and sexual assault were shown through the eyes of the assaulter, so thank God for this change. But sometimes the writing is feckless. I mean, we'll see if there's a reason behind the graphic birth scenes. Some character moments are phenomenal. Damon helping Viserys up the stairs to the throne, granted, that was a Matt Smith improv, but whatever. Or Rhaenys telling Alicent that Alicent's been a loser her whole life. Some character moments are nonsense. Damon choking Rhaenyra, or Rhaenys killing a couple hundred innocent civilians for the hell of it. But where the show will always kick ass is in the details, from the armor to jewelry, hairstyles, music, eye contact, body language, pauses, just unbelievably well done and an absolute treat to watch. Even after the self-assassination of later seasons, some scenes in Game of Thrones still make me emotional years later. I still care about Ned Stark, even though he was only in nine episodes. Based on 10 episodes here, I'm not convinced that it'll have that lasting power on its own. Nonetheless, while I would guess that Game of Thrones will be of better quality, I think I like House of the Dragon better. I don't know, too soon to call. Even at its low points though, it's a really fun show that has breathed new life into the world we all fell in love with so many years ago. And it's been years since I looked forward to a Sunday night because I just needed to see characters again and find out what happened. So for that, I'm grateful. Because this first season is the prequel to this prequel, it really only had one job, which was to get us excited for season two to remind us why Game of Thrones was once a ubiquitous cultural cornerstone. And because House of the Dragon doesn't feel the need to reinvent the wheel or replicate its predecessor, it throws itself into that task robustly. Honestly, it's nothing short of a miracle that given how dead Game of Thrones was and on a personal level, how much I wanted to hate and dismiss this show, I enjoyed the crap out of it. All of the downsides I've mentioned about the writers being too efficient come with the huge upside that the story has an end. So while I feel like someone going back to their toxic ex, I really do feel like it'll be different this time. This is no Fantastic Beasts bullshit. This is a worthy prequel spinoff and I'm glad it's here. The biggest bummer is that we'll have to wait so long for season two, but despite all the weird issues that that arose in this season, I'm confident we won't be disappointed. Also, Matt Smith should direct an episode. He clearly knows what's what. So damn, and Cassie knew who's demi-vos, Masilariot Sinulus.